Hello everyone, today we read and comment on the ninth paragraph of the second chapter of the second book of von Clausewitz von Kriege, the title being Victualing of Troops. The text follows. By one theoretical school an attempt was made to systematize another material element also by making the subsistence of troops, according to a previously established organism of the army, the supreme legislator in the higher conduct of war. In this way, certainly, they arrived at definite figures, but at figures which rested on a number of arbitrary calculations and which therefore could not stand the test of practical application. So here von Clausewitz continues with his historical approach to the explanation of how the theory of the art of war developed. And uh, these are fundamentally spoiler. Um, all um, approaches to, in fact, uh, an attempt of, of constructing a positive theory of the art of war that eventually will be rejected, right? Um, which doesn't mean that they are important, right? Uh, they're not important, I mean, and that von Clausewitz disregards them at all, right? Um, he basically lists them in order to make us understand, uh, first of all, how many factors objectively intervene, right, in the in war in general, and how difficult it is to frame them, and how this initial approach to uh, the theory of the art of war was essentially finding out, you know, r having realized that matters were way more complicated than they, than they uh, had appeared before, um, that uh, certain, um, you know, more uh, practical, even ma materialistically oriented, as we've seen, approaches to the matter were, were tried initially, right? Um, identifying objectively certain elements that that do have a you know that can be positively approached like we have seen for example uh, in the previous paragraph the superiority of numbers right that that has you know a, a, a general value as the victualing of troops and the logistical needs attached to it also have but of course uh, all of these elements will be rejected as the base of a uh, of a theory of the art of war as von Clausewitz develops it uh, for uh, starting from this approach and uh, basically uh, rejecting them one by one simply because things couldn't uh, stop simply to this individual matters right and and this was effectively uh, learned pretty hardly uh, on the field right you know th th this theory began we've always said uh, in a way that was fundamentally not so um, pervasive uh, in in the actual, uh, you know, and and it didn't quite have a, a a strong tie with the way with which, in fact, war was was factually um, actually waged. Let's say, um, but um, there is in this attempt and of in its failures, of course, this progressive, um, you know. Uh, let's say expansion and development of the same theory and recognizing how all these approaches eventually cannot be taken as uh, uh, you know the, 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 the most important uh, ones one by one but need some other approach that can consider them all and that this is what von Clausewitz eventually will, will do as we will see so the victualling of troops quite a big deal right so um, an army marches on his stomach, and objectively, um, the victualling of troops was a great problem in a certain historical period when, in fact, mm, the first permanent armies were um, were starting to be um, to to need of uh, an effective lo logistics at, at their uh, and being supported by it, um, simply because um, it's evident that, for example talking about the previous paragraphs you can have a superiority in numbers but you, you know you, you you are not going to do anything with that if your troops do not eat obviously you, you can have the, the best soldier of all times ever best training best military experience etc doesn't drink it's done it's worth it, it can be easily killed by anyone so um, the the point here is obviously understanding that you can't say oh well but, but the, the guy could maybe you know it's a sort of ramble like person who can't find you know a stream etc well no because here we're talking about 
a entire armies and entire armies cannot survive without this and this was a big deal even in s strictly talking in terms of military history um, observing in fact in times where um, the logistical needs uh, couldn't be uh, uh, fully uh, met by the organization of a you know supply chain of sort uh, by how armies behaved and were how where they marched and when they marched uh, think about I don't know this great Mongol armies of the Middle Ages when you have even uh, you know tens of thousands of of horses that need to drink an astonishingly high amount of water at all times. Well, there simply there were seasons in, uh, in which you you couldn't even set out on the on the marsh because you know there, there was not enough water and you had to to work kind of the, um, the for rivers to be you know pretty. Uh, pretty well uh, rich uh, uh, during uh, after the ice is melt uh, in order to, to find the, the enough so it's not even a matter of fighting in a desert or where there's no water because even you know in central Europe you can have a dramatic uh, lack of water if, if you and and, uh, and and your army disrupted if in fact you you don't campaign along a river or close to a lake or this great basins where you can um, satisfy the, the army's uh, thirst. So these are obvious um, statements uh, that uh, naturally can be expressed equally for food, but but not only, right? You know, the victualling here is is a is broadly meant. It's really all what what is necessary for war, and and it's interesting because also the development of of, of victualling um, is uh, the, uh, the the you know one of the um, it, it, it's so evidently testable uh, on the field how uh, the lack of, of certain elements produce, uh, uh, in fact, losses and uh, over time and then make attrition higher. And in this sense, how there is all a history of the development of logistics and what was, you know, the, the were times in which, you know, you've just, just think about medicine, right? You know, medicine uh, evolved over time, but uh, it's not there were times in which you couldn't really afford that to be applied to, to, to all soldiers uh, in the same way, in spite of our, you know, the, the medical knowledge of the time. Um, and, and and much of the practice of warfare, seen through this perspective, is very economical, telling the truth. Like, uh, troops often fight in dear straits uh, that are really... Uh, sometimes astonishingly uh, apparently human right you know you have to you know you're out there on your own most of the times and if the supply chain fails or if you simply you're cut out and or you know the the, 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 the there are certain maneuvers that oblige you to to not to access the vitrioling that you need well you have to, to find a solution because that's not uh, camping for, for summer vacations that you know you're there to kill and get killed and therefore in the most extreme conditions that you can imagine in terms of uh, uh, human interaction, right? So um, that's also why training uh, is so important. It's not much about, of, as we were making the example before, about the individual being able to survive through particular situations. That, that's the kind of training you can't give, especially to, to special forces that sometimes even they have to learn on their own. Um, it's not that the, the British SAS, you know, the, mm, uh, were sent some places to, to, to drink crotalous blood. You know, they just found themselves into that and they survived through that experience that naturally is the greatest teacher uh, at that point um, and that provides an incredible amount of, um, of advantage, and especially also in training other troops. But when we talk about large armies, it's mostly about having an efficient functioning of the same based on order and discipline, and therefore uh, facilitating all of those uh, activities that in part impact also on the victualling of the troops. Right? That's why order is so important. While uh, everything, as von Clausewitz himself uh, says about war, in, in in appearance is all very simple, right? It's not that armies are dramatically overcomplicated in their functionment. Uh, things like organics, etc., are fundamentally planned as to be as easy, as simple as possible, so that you can have 
uh, as it often is, you know, the, the, the best solution is not a dramatically complicated one. And especially in war, uh, if you think about von Clausewitz's concepts of attrition, something that is uh, enormous, you know, too sophisticated ends up most of the times for, for failing, right? Because it basically mul multiplies exponentially the chances of, 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 of failure. Uh, given that uh, the situation evolves continuously and therefore a plan even by its own, you know, for, uh, as you know, the first contact with the enemy uh, has to be rewritten. So, um, th this is important. This is w where von Clausewitz is trying to, to bring us to, right? He's making it simpler uh, in a very concise and effective way at the same time. He um, he doesn't need us for now to, to reason on this, but we, we can understand this deeper, um, uh, you know, uh, under need of 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 eventually uh, making us understand why such approaches, at the end of the day, were were, were failing mm -hmm. uh, for this the need of the the sake of creating a positive theory. So as we were saying before, it's not that these factors are not important; they are very important, and they are so important as a matter of fact. And so complex and complicated that they they do not allow you to uh, to use them in order to have a profitable positive theory in this sense. I know it sounds paradoxical sometimes because you know uh, the close of insane theory is counterintuitive, right? It, it's when you start saying you know, but you know, after all, there can't be something positive about certain approaches that you can have. Yes, and the same von Clausewitz says this. Um, here we have to, to distinguish, uh, in a certain sense, um, theory from, uh, let's say, science from art as a difference f between knowledge and action, right? You can have a great knowledge about certain things, but action is a different one. Um, so, and, and that's exactly the problem that we have, and they, they are constantly uh, tied one to another. So you cannot say that these things do not matter. Because the same von Clausewitz says, you know, if we were able to know everything at all times, we would essentially, we wouldn't even need to, to fight, because uh, at that point uh, we would understand all the strength ratios and uh, if matters would be settled because nobody would fight. Right, because they, you know, the weakest one would essentially recognize that he would be destroyed. Uh, he would have computed all the the, the various combinations in that in, in combination in that sense, and everything would freeze. But that's not a real world, and we fight wars exactly through this lack of understanding. So that's why when we talk about uh, the art of war, we have to recognize that it's like moving into a um, a world that is. Uh, that that functions paradoxically in a negative sense, right? That, that the most positive achievement you can gain from that is from recognizing the the negativity of positivist of positive approaches. Th that's that's the key, and that's where von Clausewitz really is the genius in this sense. And it's counterintuitive. I give you that. It's it's not easy. Uh, it but once you get acquainted with 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 the close of its theory, you start realizing why it works and why it's so damn effective, because it doesn't start from uh, the 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 idea that you can't know everything simply because you can't, and 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 simply uh, therefore you you have to adapt to this ignorance in some way, and try to find in this ignorance what is that that is uh, essential in in every uh, existentially speaking for the human condition. Um, the uh, points where you can profitably apply some of your knowledge in order to uh, always with the understanding that you can't basically um, have um, a, a, a concrete result by uh, hoping to sort everything out positively. You can't because the time you spend to do it, you're, you're already defeated at the end of the day. So th that's the point. Which doesn't mean you shouldn't care about knowing a lot, but you should in in invest in this knowledge in a proportionate way with your chances of applying um, this knowledge in action. That that's where it, it gets into an art.
because it's not uh, written in manuals. It's, uh, it's something way more complicated that fundamentally derives chiefly from experience. That, in turn, however, requires also a lot of other qualities that not everybody has. Right? This is what von Clausewitz says. Um, so, starting the text, von Clausewitz says, by the theoretical school, an attempt was made to systematize another material element also, by making the subsist a subsistence of troops according to a previously established organism of the army. The supreme legislator in the high, uh, in the higher conduct of war. Right. So basically, in the previous paragraph, we have seen how uh, we have said it before how um, the first attempt for for creating a positive theory of war passed through these strictly material elements. We have seen the superiority of numbers, it is kind of the simpler one. That is trying to reduce everything to ar an arithmetic sim uh, arithmetical um, system, like saying, you know, four bits, two, right? And uh, so having this very abstract uh, idea of what that could mean. And, and we have explained step by step how this theory, let's say, it, it's the least important the more it's abstract, but at the same time uh, it was still functional for the war of the time, right? Especially when warfare was strictly homogeneous in many ways. Uh, you could say simply like, what's the matter in here? It's bringing more troops on the field than the, the adversary can do. Obviously it didn't work, but in the essentials it was effectively what the, the main capabilities of those uh, political powers was at the time, talking about essentially about Renaissance warfare, right? So this is not very different from uh, medieval times. Like, the, 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 the greatest problem at that point was even to field someone who could fight properly, uh, let's say, equipped also in terms of training for, for that, right? So let's also not see this criticism as a, uh, as von Clausewitz fundamentally condemning what was going on. Because he's referring here purely to the theoretical side of the story. As a military historian, he perfectly knew that this was happening because there was a context in which uh, th that minimal level of theory was being formulated. And in this sense, the, the victualling of troops corresponds to a further stage of development of uh, European armies at that point. Um, that uh, had to do with uh, the logistics, right? So uh, he stresses th here by, by one that this conception was formulated by a theoretical school. Mm -hmm. um, so it was an attempt to systematize another material element. So we have seen there was there was numbers, men equipped in some way from war. So it, eliminating quality. This is uh, we will have to to talk about that in a while because there is an important concept behind that as well. Um, but now, essentially, realizing what the, the most impelling need that that point was, like, uh, it's not that those men obviously had been fielded um, before without without foot, <laughs> without victualling, right? Um, but now, it was, given that there was a kind of a availability of numbers that had also been increased largely, uh, given the state's capabilities to field ever larger numbers of, of, of people, uh, had to do with feeding them, right? So it, it's it's extremely fascinating to see how uh, epiphenomenal this theorization of war, uh, of the art of war, was uh, was uh, expressing itself. Uh, at this point, you have so many people that the main problem at that point it emerges most evenly, like. It's not a matter of having so many of them, but actually making them function. And the first need, equipping them, uh, feeding them, um, uh, you know, e etc. So um, this was a big deal, and naturally it had to do, probably here from Cosby's stresses the theoretical side of the story, because it starts being a, a bureaucrat's problem at this point. It's not much an administrator's problem. Um, uh, think about all the great uh, interpreters that even I don't know in in the France of Louis the Fourteenth started uh, building the state um, or even the army. Uh, at that point, not the same Louis the Fourteenth was basically no uh, 
uh, no military genius of, of any kind. Uh, he didn't, you know, he wasn't, he didn't have any military talent whatsoever. But he was one of the best military organizers in in the high, entire European history, right? And he basically changed the whole army. He he organized, and this was this great administrative fort that he made. He cared very much about this order, about this organization, um, and um, and that and that's where, where that starts, you know feeding these troops that is uh, okay being able to fill them in the first place because you have a certain degree of coercion uh, of coercive power on your na uh, on your kingdom and on the communities that live in there now however you have to start using these troops in an effective way and uh, and it was obviously noticed that the better these troops were f f uh, supplied and the better they worked mm -hmm. and this had a huge cost a huge cost. This wasn't anymore a matter of uh, you know collecting some tax and uh, hiring uh, mercenaries, mercenary companies to put together with the rest uh, troops and, and to fight like it had been like during the uh, the Thirty Years War. Now the problem was to really start filling yourself all of those troops at your own expenses. This is the true uh, birth of the modern armies, right? This is the moment where you start having fundamentally a regular army that is a military, um, uh, a permanent military uh, that you pay, you train, um, and that can be fielded theoretically, at least in, in some number, a uh, certain time. So there is always a difference between uh, professional units and those who are hired just you know like the the the, the levies uh, etc but um it, it starts making a, a great difference to be in charge now of the direct uh victualling of the troops because at that point you weren't dependent anymore on someone else like a professional of war a great uh war businessman like i don't know um the the ones during the third the Thirty Years' War, thinking about Wallenstein, or you know, this big fears that had made a living, in, in fact, in providing kingdoms with troops and and their victualling at at their own private expenses, uh, right? The, which obviously entailed business as well. Here it was a matter of of the state doing that, right? And 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 this is a great change in history of 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 the Western military because. Um, these are not like ancient armies anymore. These are armies that have started to have mm, not just massive numbers that you can find occasionally also in the ancient world, but certain technologies that amplify um, enormously the logistical needs. Think about the logistical means of artillery. That is, that was something enormous, right? And and uh, um, and not just of artillery in itself, of course, but of all the horses that had to pull that, and uh, and all the, the 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 foot that you needed for horses, and all, all the various logistical needs that entailed, you know, maybe we'll we'll have to make a video on the uh, essential uh, logistical needs of an army uh, throughout history, because uh, that gives you the, the, an enormous. Uh, have you a, uh, an idea of how much a horse drinks or eats every day? It's a, it's an astonishing amount of like. Only of drinking, it's like forty to fifty liters of water a day, and then it it the horse takes like one third of the day to 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 uh, to, to pasture, like to to eat all the grass around. You know, uh, think about all the time and all, all the calories that are spent in all of this and all the uh, logistical limitations that you have. So this is a a truly enormous problem, and never underestimate what the logistical needs of of an army could be already from. From from the medieval times, actually, to to move um, horses like stallions, like enormous beasts, like six hundred kilos already by themselves, um, that is eating fifteen kilos of stuff every day, uh, and 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 just think also about the the demand, the, the, the yeah, the, the troops' needs of uh, themselves, you know. Enormous, enormous, and this had always been problems right now, but. At this point, but they had been overcoming in different ways because the needs of these armies were had been relatively more contained. Now the needs are greater, and it's not just uh, a matter of di of, propor of 
proportionally direct uh, increase, right? Uh, the more an army increases in size, and and the more in proportion is higher the need of it. In proportion, that is not in absolute terms. It means that, to make an example, you know, if one, uh, I mean, let's say that the, the ten is satisfied with ten, uh, fifteen is satisfied with twenty, right? So it's it's a great uh, increase. Um, in the uh, in the attrition in itself, and uh, this is simply explained mathematically speaking. It's fundamentally a system. It's a larger system with more variables, and uh, that creates more problems, right? So uh, it's quite a big deal. And um, in in modern age, uh, you can argue that a great part of the force of the, the modern state uh, emerge exactly from this logistical needs of the army. Right, not really at this point feel needing to feel them, to feel the simply the troops, uh, uh, decently trained and equipped and assembling for a short time, but keeping them on the field for much longer, right, and with much larger uh, logistical needs. Mm -hmm. And and there was all a um, you know practice behind this. Uh, you know, the, 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 you, you, the, let's remember that this. Uh, this arts had are empirical by definition. Like uh, this armies had not been born just through this theorization, right? Uh, they they had managed to put them together through this enormous, almost miraculous effort, in which every single uh, individual at, at that point had a crucial role, and, and there were naturally people who made a living through this um uh through this ability of selling their own services regarding to these forms of organization so it's uh, it's very important and that's why uh this in entrepreneurs of war uh are progressively institutionalized in uh, nations because they they were needed to to build right a uh what and to systematize in fact uh such uh, ad administrative needs, mm -hmm. and always, however, bear in mind that it was a material problem, right? So th that's what von Clausewitz here is criticizing. It was still not it, it, this thing had not properly to do with the art of war in itself. Even it had to do with just bringing troops to the field, and we have seen before in the first uh, chapter of the second book that fundamentally uh, these are two very different things. That the way you 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 have to uh, you you wait to 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 command an army has naturally to do with victualling, but that's not you know victualling in itself doesn't be pertain to, st to strictly military problems, right? Oh, this ability in the organization can be uh, carried out in fact by someone else who is is not capable of telling you how to 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 fight. To make it simple. Um, and that yet you have to take into account because, especially for strategical reasons, uh, you, you in order to choose where you want to fight, um, you you must know what your uh, you know your your logistical limits are, right? So that's it's important to make these distinctions because it's really the concept at the base that that remains important. And obviously, in every uh, in every campaign, everything is different, but these things conceptually always remain separate, and and they need to, right? Because it it's essentially a um, compartmentalization of responsibilities of abilities of of art in 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 many ways. So um, we've seen this um, this other material element may by making subsistence of troops according to a previously established or organism of the army, right? So here also the problem has to do with deputing a certain part of the ar army to this service. Mm -hmm. So it's more than just saying, okay, we need some um, you know uh, logistical bases here and there, like pillaring. Like I made a video that. Uh, uh, last winter, I think it was about the uh, the Dragonade uh, of the French army during the uh, the time of the Sun King. Uh, it's quite interesting. It's quite a dark video um, in some ways um, because, uh, however, it tells you what here this broader logistical needs were 
right? And and the passage from essentially um, billeting, not pillaring, actually, what, what the hell was I saying? Because the traditional ways of victualing were, weren't enough anymore. You needed now deputed spaces that were in control of the army uh, from mil by military professionals that had to manage in this sense the, the, the resources also for victualing and um, so passing under a, a truly military administration so not an obligement that was due by uh, the, the, the subjects of of the kingdom like in medieval times like always keeping a reserve of your supply for in case the king passed by with his army and therefore you need to, to feed them but starting to take control of such things uh, under statal hands mm -hmm. and through, through the military as well so creating a properly military administration regarding to this stuff so always bear in mind by the way um, this is important as um, in general um, it's um, th this transformation as we've said also in the other paragraphs uh, is it's not really to be understood like that you know at this point in let's say the second half of the 17th century this was happening for which uh, before it, it had never existed of course of course there had always been since uh, the beginning of warfare proper always a degree of centralization of military administration of, of sort right which means that who wages war takes and deputes and in some way um, uh, a certain amount of material to be employed in a certain way, right? And and uh, let's say monarchies and uh, lordships, whatever, start creating since medieval times, but since ever basically, this uh, reserves, this military administrations. So we can't talk about permanent armies proper. There is something that practically begins just to to approximate a little bit from the mid 14th century. It's but partly conceptually had already existed since ever but it's, it's this um, need of um, aside from an army for war needing a military control certain resources so having garrisons to make it simple that can guard certain uh, important uh, strategical outposts and, and, and in this sense control s uh, resources uh, that are to be used essentially by the military right uh, just make an example castles were garrisoned during the Middle Ages and in this sense you can find a certain element of centralization when you have a permanent garrison that is paid by a, uh, a kingdom a city or whatever that at that point is not just you know a, a feudatory that stays there in the name on behalf of the king and just uh, taking measures in those own hand there's a real connection between the two like book commands and and how you you get uh, how you can be maintained at that point there um, I also wanted to make a point I think on quality but I I forgot maybe about this what I wanted to say however more or less the concepts are revolving all about this this ideas um, and 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 here uh, von Clausewitz points out how far in in many ways this take on victualing had gone obviously in the wrong direction because it here it's been transformed um, I mean the organism of the uh, of the army that is deputed to such uh, to the subsistence of the troops becomes the supreme legislator in the higher conduct of war in other words uh, it was believed that it was sufficient to have this great military administration that could supply troops in order to have victory right so giving a great importance more to uh, businessmen than military men that sometimes were actually the same pe people but uh, that um, you know uh, at that point uh, especially with the rampant growth of um, of centralized states uh, at least in some some areas of Europe uh, had uh, become those who could really manage uh, this huge amount of, of resources that ob objectively the uh, 
uh, states had never had under their control. So probably there was this um, excess of abundance that is typical of the 17th century, uh, also in, in art and science and uh, excuse me, in philosophy, etc. This idea that there is this great material wealth for the first time since a long time, and uh, the uh, um, and and that, however, that was a kind of a a delusion. Uh, it, it say it was um, uh, over this abundance. It was projected a this delusion that the simple material availability could solve a problem like war and evidently it was not so not just because eventually you know there were substantial economical crises and in general it's not that uh, these countries literally ever floated uh, in in in, uh, in gold but uh, uh, the problem was to to pretend that the matter stopped to still to quantity in some ways right so it was yes of course something different now because it was this, the quantity of numbers and the quantity of resources and therefore this big trawling of the troops was start being developed uh, as a sort of art um, that had to connect the two things and obviously it wasn't just about the quantity but about the intelligence that obviously was entailed in, in connecting the two stuff and making them work but it basically had nothing to do with how war was practically um, fought, uh, and uh, and that was a problem that w would have been met pretty pretty soon. Uh, here, von Clausewitz says even the supreme legislator, right? So, uh, and this is um, typical also of certain other views of, on on warfare that are ty typical typical of the ancien regime, right? This is still a, min a moment in which that we mostly identify for this great um, transformations that uh, uh, seem to, you know, that are a prelude to the great, um, uh, uh, the, the birth, let's say, of uh, uh, in the following century of the nation state armies and centralized, uh, complete style centralization, stuff like that. But at the time, the general mindset also on how. Um, troops had uh, how war had to be employed so by politics that is by abs at this time means by absolute monarchs was something very different it was still seen as a sort of ro royal sport mostly um, so also this idea of saying okay let's send simply our subjects to die because we um, we the, the important at this point is that we can't throw more troops against the enemy and uh, even if that has a cost, because now we have the cost, right? So it was still believed as showing the might of a sovereign and of its logistical capabilities, but not necessarily its, its own military skills, right? We were saying exactly that before, you know, Louis the Fourteenth, that is a uh, is a, a true paradoxically a true revolutionary in his own uh, kind. Uh, uh, he was, you know, he really makes France. Uh, uh, an hegemonic continental power at that point for for which all the other European powers have to ally with each other to, to contrast in, it, in its expansion but he basically doesn't understand much about war itself um, and how to wage it let's say in the art of war properly meant so um, the this paradox is is still important to make us understand still in those at those times it had been uh, necessary to um, to have uh, or at least um, it, it had happened that resources could make as a factor say uh, a greater importance than other f aspects that were given for granted meaning that obviously France it's had given this example this his own mil competent military commanders how, how they had them um, but um, uh, think about Turin or you know just uh, the, the great Grand Condé the, the point we are but uh, those people had learned about war I in a very different way and largely by experience so that's where the theory hadn't ventured yet and that's how you how you conjugate the, the two things naturally we could 
study the history of this uh, interactions also by observing other other state I mean it's obvious kind of to, to make it example of France in the second half of the, the 17th century but um, it's a problem that as we said also for the other paragraphs that you can apply to basically every single condition in uh, situation in relative terms right and there is always this uh, you know, over reliance at one point of one factor or, or another, because maybe at that point you find yourself to be extremely rich into that, but that's where you're underestimating something else. This is where Von Clausewitz tells you, you know, don't, don't be too confident about what you have, because at the end of the day, uh, if the enemy knows that you're strong on that side, you 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 will he will search for your weaknesses where where you have lowered the the guard, right? And there is this tendency. Uh, in uh, dispelling also what what you have uh, in abundance that is definitely not a um, not a great uh, thing so um, from Clausewitz uh, goes on and says uh, the, the last phrase actually it's just two phrases this paragraph in this way, certainly, they arrived at definite figures, mm -hmm. but at figures which rested on a number of arbitrary calculations and which therefore could not stand the test of practical application. Right. So probably von Clausewitz identifies in this period, I I presume, um, probably one of the the, the highest. Um, Mm, systemic over reliance on 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 this positive theories, uh, or maybe not. We will see in the future because actually, you know, he was writing from the century of positivism at this point. So uh, that probably tells us something. And as we were saying before, it's not that everybody, you know, was was so. Uh, you know, it's not that the commanders were necessarily all in love with this idea. Oh, let's have more. They, they understood that there was more than just victualling, right? Uh, but it seems that here the theoretical side of the story kind of took over, but too excessively, um, and simply because, in fact, it had, as we've seen, a very few to do with the leading of the army in itself. So, and. He and he von, von Clausewitz even gives that such calculations definitely brought to certain definite figures. I mean, I it's very important what happened at this point historically speaking. You you can't calculate how much an army can can eat, right? Uh, you know, if you know how much uh, uh, a human needs to, to eat and drink or a horse to eat and drink, you can easily calculate, mathematically speaking, how much is that you l you, you need. And it was evident to, to these people, of course, that you know these needs were greater, let's say, in certain, uh, for example, seasonal conditions than, than others. That this was an old knowledge, right? Uh, there was a time in which still, of course, uh, today, if you want, and... Uh, um, th there are uh, it's easier or more difficult to fight and this influences th the conduct of war uh, in itself um, so uh, let's not think that these figures were easy to draw because the systems start objectively to require very complex calculations in order to define you know how much an army can eat and uh, and uh, and to rely on such figures accordingly, right? But von Clausewitz tells us these figures, however, rested on a number of arbitrary calculations overall. What does this mean? It means that you can, once again, pretend to have found kind of a scientific approach to the story, saying, okay, I need this amount of food and um, the the concept is okay but uh, couldn't something worse happen <laughs> like okay you you prepare everything for for a campaign like that but what happens is that your supply uh, lines get cut off now what to 
that help serve to, I mean, obviously it served to make your army functioning up to the moment in which uh, its supply lines were cut off, but what about now? So it was evident that in, in warfare such things happen for which you have to uh, to deal with with the unforeseen and you can't base everything in pretending um, that that that's the only thing you know that matters of course already in the 18th century consider however the importance such things have like cutting off supply lines was a major concern of, as it still is a major concern of any army at this point uh, but sometimes it had become so important given the uh, you know this thing obviously uh, get more and more important quantitatively over time but for what concerns the the conduct of war proper uh, think about in the 18th century the, the great battles of the war the seven, the seven years war you know they were all aimed fundamentally at uh, confronting the enemy and trying to, to outflank him and uh, to cut off its supply lines right because of many other reasons by the way that were also strictly tactical not just strategical um, or logistical and so the whole aspect of the story is understanding that you can't obtain you can't achieve and this, and this is what greatest some of the greatest lessons also the warfare of the last uh, you know of the last century is that you can't have overwhelming means and supplies and uh, and whatever but you can still easily lose a war and and let's not think that that uh, Goliath actually has an advantage over David because in military history most of the times it's really David who has the easiest uh, let's say task if there is some degree of intellectual commitment into it meaning that uh, a as we've seen before a, a much larger system has much larger weaknesses than than a smaller one and more agile one so if the culture you're fighting is at least at your same level well most of the times uh, risk is much higher from the side of the giant than the side of of the dwarf so it's um, it, it's important to remember that numbers also in here do, do we want to um, to put numbers out of the equation of course we can't those contribute as well and you can't say actually that numbers at one point are uh, supposing that most of the time there is a uh, a decent symmetry it's not that you meet dumb peoples or that you necessarily are th that uh, different in that sense uh, but still you know numerical superiority is a very important factor at impacts not just a physical but a psychological level so um, still however we have all of these approaches that alone alone they bring you nowhere right so we will eventually go on with uh, with this factors uh, here uh, just to arrive I think it's the, the 12th paragraph I believe yes uh, that in which from closer says you know yeah they're all important but by themselves none of them is what brings you to that positive theory overall and and determining the interactions between these factors now that's the problem and it probably doesn't even make sense that's where the positivity where the science of it fails because it's not a matter of knowing we can all know how certain things interact but how will they, I mean in theory, but how will they actually interact in action? Will you have the time and the, uh, you know, the, the resources to, 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 to acknowledge that when you mostly need that? This is what von Clausewitz 
where von Clausewitz smashes everything because it's it's really the that's really the point. That's really what makes the difference. It's acknowledging that most of the times you can't acknowledge that. So you don't need a science, but you need an art. Right? Always bearing that of course art still is based on, on knowledge. And that you can't exclude that either. Um so um this was another very short paragraph. Fortunately, th the next one will be a bit larger, and but we will go um, by. We'll soon talk about interior lines and so on. So, this is an interesting um, uh, chapter because it actually deal starts dealing with more concrete matters. This historical approach to to it is, is very interesting because it, it's basically a journey through uh, not just through history but also through intelligence, right? It's how it, it, it here from Clausewitz traces how intelligence intuitively approaches these problems in, in order of interest, let's say, and uh, how it has to, to, to grade to, to lead to a different kind of approach that excludes uh, positivity uh, in itself, and uh, and yeah, we, we could add a lot um, to all of these reflections. I don't know what you think about them. I don't know whether you are watching this video for for um, because you found uh, uh, it randomly uh, out here, or you you have been following the wall the whole series since the beginning but uh, I think it's important at this point to to have realized what also von Clausewitz um, dialectical mechanism really is right and th that's very effective as as we have noticed it really gets straight to to the point uh, because unlike me uh, unlike um, this this video it doesn't stop to, to explain all of this stuff right he manages to to put them in an order that basically does not require further explanation at the end of the work and and therefore there is also this uh, enormous uh, intellectual force to to um, um, I don't even know how to 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 clean this this theory Always bear in mind that for Clausewitz, yes, he was about to finish this work before his death, but um, uh, he still, you know, this was still put in a somewhat um, temp, you know, uh, it was not finished, however, right? There had still points to, to be uh, developed, and he, he needed to, to make. Uh, sense still of, of of something just uh, the first book is finished remember this so this is meaningful because uh, there is even probably but we will talk about that only w when we will have reached a certain degree of of advancement in this thing it probably von Clausewitz uh, I mean not that we know it directly but given his theory von Clausewitz probably missed one last book, uh, which was about uh, sieges as decisive battles, but uh, there is a lot to to say, and for now we we are still just beginning to to learn the author. I, I don't know, frankly, what this um, what will I think about this this series of videos now. Uh, when if uh, first of all, I if I ever managed to, to finish it uh, to complete the form Krieger because objectively um, I've learned a lot myself ever since I began to, to make these videos about Clausewitzian theory and I finally began to, to understand it more clearly because one thing is just studying it uh, step by step and you know searching for certain uh, lines and quotes that seem uh, somewhat the resolution but you, you can't approach you can't approach the system in this way. You have to s to read it and to stop reflecting it and try to to make sense of it. 
on the base of what von Clausewitz has already given you, right? So it's not really about him that needs to be understood, but you, I mean, yes, it, it is, but uh, he he has already explained that. It's, it's most likely you who has lagged behind because you have basically not understood what he was talking about and you have always to think that such mm, um, you know everything that that is written in the film career is tied to, to what von Clausewitz has said before and this is not a, uh, an, an, an anecdote like saying well thanks my eyes you know that it's a book you mean that you have to bear in mind what what has been written before yes but not a, as a vague idea like oh, okay yeah now I, uh, I've read this stuff and uh, I can't pass on without uh, I can't go on um, uh, without having fundamentally to to mind about in detail what he said before you you actually must if you want to understand what where von Klausewitz is going because this is all a very complex and interconnected system that you can't avoid to uh, to you know to to interpret without without actually understanding step by step and its consequentiality. Uh, it's like a chain of rings. If you miss one ring, you you might have understood all the others, but still you haven't understood the wolf, right? Um, so yeah, and I don't know how long is it that I'm talking, but I assume, and I don't know how much, if I can't say something more, maybe uh, this, given that this was a short video, but anyhow, it's, it's not really a problem. And, uh, alright, so for now, let's stop it here. I hope that you enjoyed this video. If you did, please share it, otherwise leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming contents. And for now, I thank you heartily for listening to me. I wish you a nice time and see you next time. Bye.